Good morning, friends. This is Pastor Veronica Smith here with a morning devotion for you. I uh, I do want to apologize in advance. My uh, son is being very loud today, and it's a little rainy and gross out, so he's stuck indoors playing. So I do apologize if you hear shouting and the crash of Legos coming uh, from behind the scenes, but that is quarantine life. Um, and also school is out for the summer, so he is home, and that means that um, my husband is stuck entertaining him um, a lot of times, and so um, so I do want to apologize for that, but I hope that you all will offer me um, some grace on that, because that's what it means uh, to be living the COVID life. So um, we are here with a morning devotion, and what I have switched to now is we are looking at When God is Silent by Barbara Brown Taylor. And this is a book of sermons written for both lay people and pastors, few sitters, or just about anybody who is looking for a little more focus and attention on the words that they use. So this past uh, week, we looked at um, words and the way we use words. And so um, we're going to be continuing um, in this uh, first chapter of her book. And if you would like to get your own copy of When God is Silent, it's available through Cloister Books. And um, uh, I know you can still get copies because this is actually my second copy of the book. My first one, uh, well, it got pretty beat up. So, um, so what I want to do is I will read a little bit of this to you and then um, I'll stop and we're going to just uh, talk about it a little bit. As always, if you are watching this live on Facebook, I would encourage you to leave your questions or comments in the comment section of the post. I can see them live as they come up. If you're watching this later on our website and you go, oh, I have a question or I have a comment about this, please feel free. You can um, send Send me an email at pastor at colleenemmanuel.com and that's Emmanuel with an I. So I would uh, love to, uh, I'd love to hear from you and answer those questions or respond to those comments. Uh, same with if you're watching this on YouTube, you can also send me an email at pastor at colleenemmanuel.com and I'd love to, um, I'd love to hear from you and hear what you have to say and what you're thinking. And you're always welcome to do that about any of our devotions or other posts. So with that, let me continue with chapter one of When God is Silent by Barbara Brown Taylor. And chapter one is called Famine. In the same way we speak of sunrise and sunset, although we know full well it is not the sun that moves. So why do we hang on to the old language? Because it describes how things actually look to us or because the thought of earth rise and earth set gives us vertigo. The facts notwithstanding, it is easier to go to sleep at night, believing that our perspective on the universe is the stable one. How could we sleep or speak, either one, if we could actually feel the velocity of our relentless slide through space? What is at stake here is the sayability of the world. For millennia before now, human beings have written and spoken, read and heard, all kinds of words under the assumption that there was a reliable correlation between these words and the world they described. That assumption carried within it not only a belief in the reality of words, that is, in their ability to convey meaning, but also, I think, in their potential nobility. To say something well, or to hear something read well, was to reach a higher level of being, however temporarily. Why else do we have our young read Dante and Shakespeare, Emily Dickinson and Toni Morrison, if not to expose them to words we believe will improve their lives? And yet you know what has happened. In our lifetimes, language has taken a terrible hit. I cannot say that it has never happened before, but I do know that it is happening now. So many frontal assaults on language, on the reliability of the word that is difficult to list them all. We may leave the complexities of deconstructionism and post-structuralism to the experts. Most of us can collect enough evidence of language and distress right where we live. There is first of all the assault of consumerism, which forces words to make promises they cannot keep. Pressed into service on billboards, in newspaper ads, on television, and on the telephone, words are chosen not for their truthfulness, but for their seductiveness. What they mean is beside the point. 
what they seem to mean is all that counts. Where I live, subdivisions subdivision spring up in cow pastures like mushrooms overnight. Since they all look the same, developers work hard to give them distinctive names. One is called Harbor View, although the nearest body of water is 30 miles away. Another is called Autumn Breeze, although that is only true for three months out of the year. What the words mean is beside the point. It is what they seem to mean that counts. Their value lies in the fantasies they inspire and in the power of those fantasies to separate people from their money. Even those of us who resist the strategy cannot save the words employed in it. Once you have bitten into a mealy, pale pink tomato, it is hard to forgive the sign that said, fine, ripe. Those two words will be suspect from now on, although your tongue knows exactly what they mean. <clears throat> the problem is the discrepancy between the word and the reality. Because the connection has been lost, the language is no longer trustworthy. You must devise other methods for determining the truth. While it is really a variety of consumerism, journalism has launched its own assault on language. In the case of news shows, magazines, newspapers, and newsletters, the attack is not so much on the truthfulness of words as it is on their longevity. At my house, pounds of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal are tossed aside with whole sections unread. My guilt over this is softened by the knowledge that the newsprint will have a second life. Once a month, I haul it to the county recycling center where it is shredded into cheap bedding for local, local chicken houses. After the chickens are through with it, I am told, it is fed to cows who somehow benefit from the nutrients in it. Thus, yesterday's 48 point headline becomes tomorrow's cow food in a process that is as pragmatic as it is strange. The moral is that there is no sense getting attached to the news nor to the realities a reporter's words represent. How did that community recover from the hurricane? What happened to the children after their mother died of AIDS? Did the sheriff really do it, or did they arrest the wrong man? Don't ask, just let it go. There will be more stories tomorrow that are just as compelling. The word is transitory, cheap. Oh, I didn't read as much this time as uh, last time because, well, let's be honest, there's a whole lot going on. And in fact, I'm going to mark it because when I first read this through, I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to read. I'm going to read like seven pages like I did last time. But but I just couldn't because there was just so much, especially now, um, especially with all of the saturation of news that we're reading. Now, of course, when this was written, and in fact, I'm gonna double check in the front of the book to just clarify when this was written because, um, because that makes a difference. So this was written in 1997. Um, and what's funny is, even though some of the references are, um, well, they're missing some of the timeliness, but they're really not, we just, read a lot of those sources that she refers to, well, we read them online, don't we? You know, we get our news from, from social media. Um, my family watches um, The Daily Show um, with Trevor Noah on uh, YouTube. And sometimes, um, you know, I read my local news, the Colleen Daily Herald. I, I get that online. It's emailed to me and then I read it online. Um, other news stories that I gather, I get through Facebook where I see, oh, here's a link to um, a, a news story from the local news television station. Um, we still read news magazines and newspapers and things, but a lot of us are getting that content digitally. We're getting it online. And sometimes I really think that even though this was written that long ago, um, you know, 1997 does not seem that long ago, but you're talking, that's 23 years ago. That, that's a long time. And yet 23 years later, we still get that. We get the saturation of words from our news stories and how sometimes, you know, the words themselves are fine, but they lose some of their, their strength. I think I sort of look at it as like, you know, when you fix tea and you, you know, you have your, your cup of hot water and you put your tea bag in and you let the tea bag sit in there and steep and the tea gets stronger. And to me, that's when, you know, we, words become more meaningful. The less water we have in there, the stronger the tea is, the more valuable it is as far as taste is concerned. But when you keep adding more water to that, the tea isn't as strong. It doesn't taste as good. And 
I feel like when we are just constantly slammed with words everywhere we look, from an email to a text message to um, an article online to our social media and, and whatever it is we're using, however we're getting that content, when we're just slammed with words constantly, they almost feel watered down to me. Um, and, and I appreciate that, that Barbara Brown Taylor mentioned this, you know, 23 years ago. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. That makes total sense. That's perfect for now. And I, I think that, um, I think that we also, you know, we still have that idea here in Colleen, there are subdivisions being built all the time. Now I haven't noticed that ours have, um, have names so much. Um, I know that our neighborhood from our paperwork from our mortgage is called Purser Crossing, um, which doesn't necessarily advertise anything false, but there's no sign at the entryway to our neighborhood that says that anyway, so it, it doesn't matter. But I have lived in places where, you know, I've seen that and I've gone, you know, why is that neighborhood called that? It, it doesn't seem like it would be connected or associated with that, but it does it to draw people in, to bring some uniqueness. Um, and I think that we can be guilty of that in church, that when we when we are saturated with so much that that sometimes things get watered down one of the things that um that i've talked about um with some folks is is the word or the phrase i'm sorry um when you hear someone constantly apologize constantly right i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry you start to wonder if it's genuine, if it's meaningful, if those words have any power behind them at all, because they're watered down at this point when you hear it over and over and over again. When someone doesn't apologize flippantly, but only when they feel it's genuine and necessary and important, that phrase, I'm sorry, is so much stronger. You notice, you pay attention, you go, wow, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever experienced this person apologize in such a strong way before. Wow, they must really mean it. Same can be said for the phrase, I'm praying for you. Have you ever said that to somebody? Have you ever said, oh, I'm praying for you? Or has someone ever said that to you? One of my um, pastor uh, friends, I noticed he, he shared a comment. What does it mean when someone says to you, I'm praying for you? Or what do you think it means? Or what, what do you mean? Or what do you do when you tell someone you're praying for them? And I thought about that a lot. And I had uh, in Haiti, when I was there doing um, a medical mission, and uh, one of the, the missionaries that I spoke to there, um, when he did a devotion with our small group. He said that when you tell someone you're praying for them, he said, well, what do you do? I said, well, you know, I make sure I include them in my, my daily prayers, whether that's first thing in the morning or before I go to bed. And he said, stop doing it like that. Well, what do you mean? And Rob, that was the name of the missionary. Rob said to me, the next time you tell someone I'm praying for you, or he said, don't say it that way. He said, tell them, I'd like to pray for you and ask if you can pray for them right then and there. And I said, oh, well, don't you think that would freak them out a little bit? No. Well, it may maybe make them feel weird, but I promise you that God will be there, the Holy Spirit will be present, and Jesus Christ will be in every word you say. And the person who's there will hear your prayers and know them in a way that they wouldn't have if you walked away and did it later. And I will tell you that that was very powerful. And I think completely differently about the phrase, you know, I'm going to pray for you. When I tell someone, when they say, oh, I need prayers right now, I'll, I will tell them, you know, if it's a post on social media, I might comment back and say, praying for you. I'm praying for you right now, or prayers are going up. And I will literally stop what I'm doing and offer my prayers in that moment. And when I say that to someone where I need prayers, if someone says to me, you know, I'm going to pray for you right now, or can I pray for you right now? And 
and they say that, I say, yes, please pray with me right now. And, and I will want to hear their words and hear their prayers because it just feels like those words have more value when people can experience the actions that go with them right away. I think it's a great lesson for us to consider the strength of our words, to be cautious that we don't water them down, that, you know, when we're telling somebody praying for you, that we're not just typing it on a page and assuming that that just means that there's been a prayer said or assumed, but that we, we say, I'm praying for you. And we literally stop what we're doing and pray for that person. And I think we are hesitant to do that so often because I think we're afraid to pray and not do it perfectly. We don't need to have prayers that sound like something on television or in a movie. Our prayers can be a conversation. God doesn't want our watered down prayers that use God's name in like six different ways. Loving, healing, creator, fabulous, God who makes all of us. And then we say our little quick prayer and then we give a whole bunch of other things, platitudes or seven different adjectives to describe Jesus. God doesn't need all of that. So there's a time and a place for those sorts of prayers, more eloquently spoken ones. But God doesn't need that from us. God needs our strong tea, not our watered down tea. So think about that the next time you offer a prayer for someone. The next time you lift up a prayer to God, keep it simple. Keep it to the point. Don't water it down and put strength behind those words by offering them right away. So that's what I have for you today. And I look forward to uh, sharing some more of uh, Barbara Brown Taylor's When God is Silent with, um, with all of you. Uh, again, we have a morning devotion on Wednesdays at 11 and an evening devotion on Wednesdays at 6.45 p.m. So please consider, consider joining me for one or the other or both. I do read the same section the second time, but the discussion doesn't always go the same way. So you might learn something new or experiencing some, experience something different. With that being said, God loves you and so do I. Have a wonderful day. Bye.